Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's video is a tabletop overview and buyer's guide to the Schmidt Rubin series of rifles that came out of Switzerland around the turn of the century up until about the 1960s as they stayed in service. Now, as the different models progressed, some subtle changes and nuances were made to the platform, which gave us this big variety of different models that you can still purchase today as surplus. I know I, for one, when I first got into these, it was a little bit overwhelming all the different uh, models that existed and sort of what the differences were. So the purpose of this video is to explain that. Anyway, if that all sounds interesting to you, stick around, that's coming up now. So let's go ahead and do an overview of first what I have here. Right up here is the model 1889. Then we have the model 189611 or 9611. Then the model 1911. Then the model K11. Then the model K31. These five generally make up the top five most common ones that you've seen. There are a few models that sit in between these that are uh, kind of harder to come by that you don't see very much of and that were converted into different models that you see here. So so what we have here basically covers the gambit of what you're going to find in the Schmidt Rubin family. So this is what we have here to go over. So let's go ahead and lay some groundwork on this. So Schmidt Rubin, Rudolf Schmidt was the designer of the action and Edward Rubin was the designer of the ammunition. Pretty simple, Schmidt Rubin. Now we start up here with a model of 1889. Let's go ahead and jump into this and then move forward. So the most important thing about the 1889 is it was designed for the GP90 ammunition, which was 7.5 by 53.5 millimeter, which was actually a paper patch cartridge. It did use smokeless powder, and it would be the replacement for the Vetterly rifle, which was in service at the time. Now, the new ammunition by today's standards is nothing really to write home about, but at the time was definitely an upgrade as the Vetterly did have a very large arc in its trajectory, but the new ammunition was still by today's standards pretty much of an arc but a lot more flat shooting and a lot more accurate in general. Now, with that being said, you can get the 1889s on the market today. They are not that expensive. They are considered antiques, so you do not have to go through a CNR or an 01 FFL transfer if you want to buy one. But keep in mind, the more commonly available GP11 ammo, which I'll talk about in a minute, the 75 by 55 millimeter Swiss that everybody's familiar with, that is too hot of a pressure for this firearm. So if you get this, keep in mind it was designed for an older cartridge that you will want to reload yourself if you plan on shooting. Now, this is a really beautiful and very iconic, distinct looking rifle. And some of the characteristics, there are basically three prominent characteristics that set this rifle apart from its uh, future counterparts. Uh, number one is the magazine. It did have a removable 12 round box magazine. And the latching system is very interesting. It's sort of this lever that you have to push down and then that will allow the magazine to come out. When you pop the magazine back in, you just have to throw that lever to lock it down. You see this sort of machined out recess here. There is a corresponding notch underneath this lever that that's what it's locking into. So definitely a lot of machining work and pretty complicated. There's no automatic latching system that you would typically see today and especially on the later Schmidt Rubin designed rifles. The next one is the sights, and I've never seen a sighting system on another rifle from this era that works quite this way, but you basically have a spring-loaded latch here that you pull, squeeze, and lift, and then it locks into a notch and this sort of roller coaster looking elevation is simply here. Now to lower it, you just squeeze that notch and bring it back down. So you can select, there are small numbers right here. You can select the range you want to fire at in meters, squeeze that latch, bring it up to the designated range you want to, you want the rifle to be sighted in at. And then there you go. If you want to bring it back down, just drop it down here. And remember the lowest elevation setting was 300 meters. The next thing was the bolt. You will notice that this is actually pretty much the same design concept as you are going to see on the other Schmidt Rubin series of rifles all the way up until the K31 with one difference. On this, the 1889, the locking lugs are actually towards the back of the bolt. On future designs, those locking lugs would be moved forward here, which I will show you in a minute. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the Schmidt Rubin design or the Rudolf Schmidt action, it's very simple. It's a straight pull. You grab the handle here. Go ahead and when you, your first initial release is right here. It unlocks the bolt from the action. Then you can go ahead and bring it back to the rear. That will then eject your cartridge. Push it back in. That chambers another round. Locks the 
uh, the bolt on those locking cam. There's there is a cam inside which rotates those locking lugs and locks the bolt into the receiver, and then it's safe to shoot. It is a little bit weird when you're firing one of these for the first time. Uh, it almost feels like this thing is going to jam back into your face, but definitely won't. It's a very strong action, very strongly locked up in there. Now keep in mind. And the later variations, which I'll talk about in a minute, those locking lugs were moved forward to reinforce the strength of the action. One other feature here is if you grab this ring, you can pull it out and turn it, and that is your safety. Now, after the Model 1889, we move into the Model 1889-96, which I do not have here, but very simple to explain that rifle. It is exactly the same as the Model 1889, except for those locking lugs are moved from the back of the bolt to the middle of the bolt, which I just explained. Now here in this hand, I have the bolt for the Model 1889. And in this bolt, I actually have the bolt from the 9611, but the concept is exactly the same for the change that was made on the updated model of the 1889, the 8996, where you moved these locking lugs here to the front right here. Now these locking lug positions would stay the same all the way up through the K31 and then would be changed. The whole bolt would be redesigned for the K31, which I will get to in a minute. Now, other than the design change on the bolt locking lugs, the 1889 and the 8996 were the exact same. They also still fired from the GP975 by 53.5 millimeter uh, ammunition on the lower pressure. So if you come up with an 18 8996. Again, do not shoot the more modern GP11 ammunition in that rifle. Now from there, we did have two carbines that did come out that are not very commonly seen today, and I'm just going to touch on those briefly. So first was the 1897 Cadet rifle, which was more of a carbine length uh, rifle, and it was a single shot, mainly used for training by cadets. It had a lower pressure ammunition. Uh, those you typically don't see very many of today. I think that less than 10,000 of those were made, and who knows how many of those are actually in circulation in the United States today. Probably not very many. When they come up on the market, they're usually around the eight, nine hundred dollar range, respectively, uh, few and far between. But did not really were not really issued as a battle rifle. Again, it was more of a trainer. Then from there, we have the Model 1900 short rifle, which was to replace the then used Model 1893 Manlicker straight pull carbine, which was mainly used by the cavalry. Uh, much more popular design. Now from that carbine, we did get the introduction of, an, of a six round detachable box magazine, which was a modification from the standard 12 round. Now that was the only design feature that would really be important. That was a big change that we saw between that and the 9611 that you see here. Um, but most of those 1900 carbines, you're not going to find them in that configuration anymore, uh, as most of them were converted into the K31 after the, I'm sorry, the K11 after the K11 went into service. Now, jumping over the 9611 into the 1911, because this, the 9611 kind of bridges the gap between the 89 and the 1911. So on the 1911, this again, this is about the time of World War I that this is being designed. So the rifle is going to see a lot of characteristics that a lot of other countries are moving into and in their development of their rifles respectively. So kind of borrow some of the uh, Italian Carcano features a little bit from the German Gewehr uh, rifle. So what you see is a change primarily. Now again, remember that 1900 rifle that I, or uh, carbine that I talked about was a change from the 12 round box magazine to the self-locking six round magazine here. This feature would be carried over into the 1911 rifle. Another thing would be the changing of the sights. So we move from this more complex sighting feature to a more traditional uh, tangent sight starting at 300 meters, which again, you would typically find on a lot of other battle rifles at around this time. Now, we also have the creation of the new GP11 ammunition, which this and the 9611 would be chambered in. So the 9611 and the 1911 are safe to shoot on the new GP11 ammunition, which you find today. Because of the change to the higher pressure ammunition, they went from a three groove barrel, which you had in these, to a four groove barrel. Another thing they did is they rounded out the contours of the stock and they added a semi pistol grip, which again, if we're moving from the standard straight stock here, there's a pistol grip here. And then the back of the uh, 1889, you see it's a very squared off at the top here. Here on the 1911, 
It's very rounded. Just a lot more sleek and ergonomic pistol grip here. Now at this time, we have the production of the 1911 going on, but we also have a lot of 1889-96 rifles that need to be retrofitted. So what they did is they took those 1889-96 or model 96 and converted it into the 1911. So therefore you get the model 96 11. By doing so, we take characteristics of this rifle. Remember, the 8996 was just like this. It just had the locking lugs move from the back to the front of the bolt, otherwise identically the same rifle. You take a rifle just like this and you convert it into this. So what we have is the stock characteristics of this original rifle here, which of course we see, you see the sort of contours of the same because it started as the same stock. Because originally this was a straight stock or a scant stock, whatever you wanna call it, and the 1911 has a semi-pistol grip here, what they needed to do was add one of their own. So they just cut out a piece of the wood and then grafted in a semi-pistol grip, which there I'll show you, you see where it's grafted. And so all the 9611s, that's the biggest telltale characteristic right there is that grafted on grip. Now we already had the new bolt system we talked about that was added. We switched the magazine from the 12 round magazine to the standard six round magazine used on the 1911 now. They replaced the older sight with the new tangent sight. And of course it was now able to handle the pressures of the new GP11 ammunition. An 1889-96 converted into a 1911 for the new GP11 ammunition, 9611. So this, this sort of bridges the gap between the two is this one. Now around this time, we're moving past 1911, we're starting to see a lot of countries move into a carbine. And the carbine is starting, it, well, it was started as an ancillary rear echelon firearm, which later into World War II would turn into the primary issue rifle. But at that time, Switzerland, just like everybody else, realizes the need for a carbine. So what do they come up with? The model 1911 carbine or the K11. Now the K11 is just basically a redesigned 1911 into a shorter package. The bolt characteristics are exactly the same. It uses the exact same detachable six round magazine. It is chambered in the GP11 ammunition, so the hotter pressured ammunition with a four groove barrel. We also have the, uh, the pistol grip stock with the rounded comb here on the back. Now, a couple of the changes that were made to the K11 from the 1911 is of course the overall length is shortened. So of course the sights are in the same location, but the handguard is going to now encompass the entire length past the sights over the barrel. And the sights themselves are shortened. So again, we saw this in Italy with the Carcano carbines is that you realize with a carbine, you're not going to be shooting out to such great distances. So the sights themselves were shortened so far, somewhere around, I think it was 15, 1500 meters, whereas opposed to the rifle, it would go out to 2000. So about 25% less on the range, even though it's the same ammunition, but a shorter carbine. Again, expected for more closer in engagements. One other thing that was changed was the front sight. This is the same front sight system we're going to see on the K31. Whereas the front sights on the older rifles are just dovetailed in and, and you just tap them back and forth to change windage. Whereas now on the K11, you have these protective ears and you can see a slant cut right here into this channel. And actually to change your windage, you just move the sight base forward and backwards, which forces it in a diagonal pattern, changing your windage. It's actually kind of clever and I haven't seen that used on any other rifle. Okay, now we're moving from the traditional World War I era until the World War II era. So here we have the 30, 1930s with the K31. So then we move into the 1930s and we're here with the K31. Now at this point in time, sort of in the 30s and 40s, most countries had abandoned the traditional long World War I style rifle in favor of a standard issue carbine length rifle. You have the Germans with the carabiner carbine, uh, K98K meaning short, that was standard issue, no longer the big Gewehr 88s or anything like that. So now standard issue carbine. British always sort of had a standard standard length uh, rifle slash carbine with the number one Mark III into the number four Mark I. The Americans with the 1903s, again, those were sort of standard length and then into the M1 Garands, which were about this length as well. Uh, you have Italy with a standard issue uh, carbine and also they had their uh, 1941 Carcanos as well, which were longer. 
But Switzerland, even though Switzerland was neutral, they were paying attention and realized the standard issue carbine was the way to go. So the carbine was no longer ancillary, it was issued to everyone as the K31. Now, there were different echelons of the Swiss military, usually broken down by age groups, and some of those rear defense echelons would still be issued the long rifles, even through that period, uh, even up until the 1950s, but primarily this would be our new battle rifle. From the K11 to the K31, there's really one big difference made. There are a couple of subtle changes throughout, but the big difference that's made is the action. So the K11 has a traditional long bolt that is used in the other variations of the Swiss straight poles. And the K31, the bolt has been completely redesigned to a short action. So here you see the very distinct difference, K11 and K31. Uh, so what we have is the bolt body this is sort of the locking area, and then the bolt face is all the way up here. It's like a two-piece bolt. It was completely redesigned into a traditional sort of standard bolt, uh, bolt length that we would be used to on other rifles. Now, the locking uh, lugs are actually right up here at the very front, right at the bolt face, which is going to give you the strongest action. And then, of course, you have such a short package. One other thing while we are here is the Bolt handles are now changed to metal, which is a lot more durable. I think these are aluminum, which is a lot more durable product than the sort of Bakelite hard rubber, which you see here, which in most cases are broken or chipped, which is pretty much the case in every one I have here on the table, except for this one. This one's actually still intact, uh, surprisingly. Now, because of the change in the bolt design, the action is much, much smaller. So here you see the whole length of the bolt traveling to here, and then this is sort of where the barrel begins on the K11. On the K31, everything has been compacted down into this length, and the barrel starts, the chamber is right here. So you can see that amount of space, I've kind of lined up the back of the receivers, the amount of space here that's saved on the bolt. That then allows the sights to be moved back. You now have a larger sight radius, which is of course good for accuracy. The sights work very much the same way. There's a little bit of a design change, but they work sort of as a tangent rear sight here that can be elevated for, uh, of course, elevation changes. And then the front sight, like on the K11, works the exact same way as I just showed you. There was also a design change on the magazine. So the, the magazine stylizing is just a little bit different, but not a huge kind of change there. And of course, this would have fired the standard GP11 ammunition. Now, the K11 rifles are sort of, by most people, the most desirable. It is the most refined version of the Schmidt Rubin platform. These are going up uh, pretty high in price. Uh, you used to find these about three or four years ago for about two or three, four hundred dollars. Now they're getting up to six, seven, eight hundred dollars, depending on the condition, which is crazy. The K31 was manufactured between 1931 and 1958. This one itself was actually made in 1958. Now the post-World War II ones are typically noted by having a Parkerized finish like this one. The earlier ones would have a blued finish like the rest of these, so that's one sort of distinguishing characteristic there. Now after production ended, these did stay in service through the 1960s. Anyway, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking this out. If you have any questions, please leave those down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. Uh, if you want to see more content like this, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn on your uh, bell notification button so you can see when we are getting new content out. Anyway, I'm gonna leave you with that. My name is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.